Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and this episode is part one of what winds up being a two-parter on Blazor, which is an experimental technology that could revolutionize the web development world. Um, I had Sam Bazu and Ed Charbonneau uh, here a few weeks back. They were here for the Visual Studio Live conference, which was on Microsoft campus. I taped a bunch of episodes with them, and they wanted to do an episode on Blazor. Unfortunately, I had a conflict, and Dimitri wasn't available, so I left them alone in the studio. Uh, they were so excited, they spoke for an hour, so we're going to cut that in half. This is the first half of them explaining to us what Blazor is. Hello and welcome to VS Toolbox Show. My name is Sam Basu. Robert Green is busy, so I'm uh, filling in for the day. And with me, I have uh, Ed Charbonneau, and we're going to talk about something very exciting, especially in the ASP.NET land, with Blazor and WebAssembly, right? Yep. So I'm a huge fan of Blazor right now. It's uh, an experiment that's being worked on by the ASP.NET team, Daniel Roth and Steve Sanderson. They're, they're uh, working hard experimenting with this new framework. So I'm Happy to have the opportunity to come on Visual Studio Toolbox and kind of share that story with everyone. Awesome. Tell us more about it. So my name is Ed Charbonneau. I'm a developer advocate with Progress, or you may know them as Telerik. Sam here is a, pro a developer advocate at Progress as well, a co-worker of mine, and we've kind of invaded the uh, Visual, uh, Visual, <laughs> Visual Studio Toolbox. Uh, episode here uh, to talk about Blazor. Uh, so I am an author. I do some writing. Uh, I have a podcast called Eat Sleep Code. And uh, if anybody ever wants to reach out and get in touch, just uh, give me a shout at on Twitter. Okay. All right. So let's let's dive in. What's the what's the hoopla? Sounds like there are some very sharp minds behind this at Microsoft and other places. So tell us more. So as a web developer that specializes in C sharp, one thing that I've always wanted to have is the ability to write C Sharp and create client-side applications using it. OK. So uh, to kind of back up, so with ASP.NET, uh, is it entirely server-side? We can do some things client-side, right? but it's all in JavaScript. Right now, if you want to write an application that's running in the browser, you're going to have to leverage JavaScript. But there's some new things that have come around with uh, WebAssembly, which okay. is a, uh, a way of natively writing code for your browser, browser that it understands using web standards. Mm -hmm. uh, this, it's a bytecode format. Okay. So it's similar to an assembly language. But it runs natively inside the browser, and the browser understands it. So we're starting to step away from the days where JavaScript rules the browser only, mm -hmm. and we're allowing some new things into the ecosystem. OK. So from what I understand, like every browser has a JavaScript engine, right? V8 mm -hmm. or, or Chakra or uh, WebKit. And it's these engines that run JavaScript natively in the browser client side. So now we're saying there is something more that the browser can run, and that's the web standard that you talked about. Yeah, and I want to point out this is a web standard because okay. we've tried some things like this before. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> well, things have changed. Things have changed. And um, uh, so maybe to back up, so uh, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of Silverlight back from the, the days. Mm -hmm. um, Flash uh, was, a, was a plugin, and sure, it had some vulnerabilities. I think Steve Jobs kind of wrote a scathing letter one time to say, <laughs> uh, so it, essentially, when you run Flash on Safari, it makes your tiny iPad heat up, and that's uh, not something Steve liked. Mm -hmm. So he uh, essentially kind of killed the plugins model, and along with it, like we never said Silverlight is done, but we just kind of stopped talking about it. And, Maybe the plugins model just didn't scale for the web. So now we're saying we're not going to do plugins. This is different. No, no plugins. And don't get me wrong, these were things that were necessary at the time. Mm -hmm. And people were doing uh, the best, you know, with the best tools that they could uh, to build amazing applications. I'm sure there's some just phen uh, phenomenal uh, Silverlight applications out there that people have built. But now is the time to start moving on to something else. We're going to yeah. drop all those plugins and just use things that the browser understands natively. Yeah, I mean, with Silverlight though, I mean it wasn't just the plugins model. Like people who did Silverlight, we just enjoyed the dev experience, the rich ecosystem, mm -hmm. the data binding with C Sharp and Xamarin. And I think as developers, all of those skills, I mean, they move forward uh, with uh, be it UWP, be it WPF or Xamarin Forms. Uh, so you can build cross-platform apps with the same skill sets. Oh, now, absolutely. We're just trying to see how we can bring that dev mojo back, the ease of using Visual Studio and C Sharp, but do it differently in the browser. Right? So how right. so? So let's start off with uh, no WebAssembly. Let's, okay. How does the browser work without it? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So normally we feed the browser HTML and JavaScript pages. Those things go through a parsing, and then the comp they are kind of pre-compiled. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are turned into a JavaScript tree, and the JavaScript engine inside the browser interprets that into a, uh, a bytecode. Right. So it gets JIT compiled, turns into bytecode, and then things happen within the browser. Okay. So that's kind of where WebAssembly happens. What they've done is think of this kind of like, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, dependency uh, inversion of control, right? Okay. So we have this, this part of our browser that understands this bytecode. Uh, what if we took that, that part of the browser and exposed that to where developers could target it? Mm. So this is WebAssembly. So we can target this bytecode now and, and give that to our browser, and our browser understands how to execute that bytecode. So okay. when we do that, we open up that input to things like C++, Rust, Go, and our favorite C Sharp. Okay, so now you're talking about like higher level programming languages being able to write things that we're going to compile down. Maybe not com compile is maybe not the right word, but <laughs> bring it down to that low level assembly-ish code which the browser can execute on its own. Yep. Okay. And there's one more clarification to make here. This isn't bytecode that would run on your machine. Right. So this isn't something that's going to get loose and have security issues. Right. And right. Uh, it can't, it's, for example, a library that you send down isn't going to be able to access your system registry or run natively on your Windows desktop. Okay. So it is still running in the browser shell, so to speak. And it's very much sandboxed. Okay. Right. And, and the bytecode is only going to be understood by the browser. It's not something that's used outside of the web. So why should I trust WebAssembly? Is this like a, a standard that the web community has accepted? Absolutely. Okay. So this is a web standard. It's in all the evergreen browsers. And then also if you have another browser that's say maybe on a mobile device, there's some manufacturers that like to ship their own web browsers and mm -hmm. uh, those don't always have standards that are up to what we expect. Uh, there are uh, polyfills that okay. can polyfill in WebAssembly. Okay. So it will be compatible with those as well. All right. So you mentioned like modern browsers. So is that like Edge, Safari, Chrome, all of their latest bits will support WebAssembly? Yeah. So when we say something like an evergreen browser, that's one that doesn't have a hard version number right. that we're tracking. It auto updates. You know, for example, for like IE789, right. where Edge, you know, you're always on the latest version. Okay. So Apple is on board with this. <laughs> okay. Edge, that's Safari, yeah. Chrome, those uh, Firefox, uh, the big ones. That, that many of the users use. Uh, those are the ones that you would expect to have the, the native uh, use of WebAssembly. And then the other ones, like I said, the polyfill works. Right. There's a little bit of a performance gap, obviously, with that, that type of approach, but at least your app works. Okay. All right. So this is where Blazor enters the picture. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple modes of how Blazor can run. Uh, one of those is very new. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But what I want to focus on right now is the uh, experience where you're developing for the, the browser, the client, okay. uh, and you're running the application on the client. Okay. Uh, there is an opportunity to run it on the server, and this diagram doesn't quite fit that model. Okay. So right now we're talking client side. Why, why Blazor? What's, what's with the name? <laughs> so the Blazor uh, uh, name came from Razor. So we're okay. going to use Razor to create our markup for our application, mm -hmm. and then uh, the the Blazor part of it uh, comes from the... Um, is running it in the browser? Yeah, in the browser. Okay. So browser, Razor, Blazor. I see. Right? I see. Okay. So like Razor is the syntax that we use to build ASP.NET applications, be it uh, MVC or ASP.NET Core. You're saying we're going to use the same syntax, but it's going to just run client-side in the browser. Yeah. Okay. So if we, lo we look at the, the diagram here, what happens is, remember that, that model we had before, we're going to feed the browser HTML and mm -hmm. JavaScript only. Mm -hmm. Now we're using uh, the Blazor framework. And the Blazor framework, um, it renders those, those C-sharp, or sorry, the, uh, the, the Razor CS HTML mm -hmm. files. Those get turned into HTML, which the browser understands. Okay. Uh, then we take uh, Mono. So Mono, the... Uh, the runtime that can target multiple platforms, they're yep. now targeting the browser. Oh, so. Okay, so this is Mono under the covers. And I mean, yep. and Mono as we know, I mean, that, that's not a new thing. I mean, Mono's been around since .NET has been around. So it's the port of .NET to other platforms. Mm -hmm. And that's how uh, Xamarin apps run today uh, on iOS, Android, and other platforms. So you're saying 
we will use Mono to bring your C Sharp down to WebAssembly. Yes. Okay. So Mono is compiled to run on WebAssembly. Okay. And then Blazor is a framework that sits on top of that. Okay. Now, Blazor is able to take and load your uh, DLLs directly into Mono. And Mono is running those in, in an interpreter into the browser. OK, so it is being interpreted at runtime now, but eventually you might have a little more static compilation, make things a little more faster. Yeah, so right now this is the way it's happening. Okay. Uh, there are, I've, sp I've spoke with Daniel Roth, and there are uh, ideas around maybe collapsing the stack at mm -hmm. a final compilation stage where okay. all of your application gets compiled into WebAssembly directly. Okay. So when it loads into the browser, uh, it's at native speeds, and there, there's nothing inhibiting that direct pipeline into the browser. Right. Now, uh, the way this works now, you know, this is a great development experience because when we compile, we're compiling it to DLLs, sure. and then uh, Mono is handling that WebAssembly uh, inter interpretation for us. Okay. So the compilation time is very short. If mm -hmm. we were to take our entire application and compile it, that compilation time would take quite a bit of time, and our development process would be slow. Sure. So sure. this is a, a very fast way to iterate on an application and build it. Um, and then in the future, we may have that longer compilation to get the final package you know, tightened up and ready to send down to our, our users. OK. Now I see uh, blazor.js and mono.js. What, what are those? So those are kind of intermediate uh, layers for the browser to help do things like JS interops. So we have a JavaScript interop layer. So there are things mm. that WebAssembly doesn't support yet. Okay. Uh, so there might be times where we need to fall back on JavaScript. So we can actually talk to JavaScript from within WebAssembly. So from .NET code, you can call JavaScript and back and forth. Correct. Okay. So we can actually do that bidirectionally. Mm. We can call JavaScript modules and functions from within Blazor. Interesting. And then we can also, from JavaScript, invoke .NET functions. OK. So right. that's, that's one reason those two JavaScript files are there. Uh, the other part is just loading the application up. So sure. uh, the mono JS uh, takes and loads, bootstraps up the Blazor assemblies. Yeah. And then Blazor has those interop layers and uh, communicates down through uh, mono JS into those interops directly. OK. So we've got a nice stack and workflow here uh, that we can build some pretty uh, interesting applications yeah. already. Now, it's worth saying that Blazor is an experimental project still. Sure, for now. Uh, we're in release 0.5.1 mm -hmm. as of recording. Uh, the first 0.1 release was just in March. So sure. it's only six months old. It's a baby. Uh, it's got a lot of growing to do. Yeah. Uh, but, but I hear it's come a long way. It's come the tooling. quite a long way. Yeah. Um, they are making uh, some some good investments in you know producing this experiment, and it's nice to have this experimental phase because they're able to think outside the box, sure. yeah. uh, do and some creative yeah. uh, experimentation with it, and not have to worry so much about breaking changes at right. the moment. Yeah. And, and the community gets to weigh, and we developers get to try it out and see what works and where the pain points are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So back on this diagram, I mean, this is all client side, right? This so is absolutely all client side. Um, and Blazor, uh, is, it can run out of process. So we, we don't need to necessarily be tied to WebAssembly. Okay. Uh, we can do it on the server. And we'll, we'll get into a project. Uh, this is actually something that shipped in 0.5.1. So it's very, very new. Where we can run the framework mm -hmm. on the server side. So we don't have to compile it down and then send it uh, uh, into the mono uh, WebAssembly runtime. We can use the regular .NET runtime on the server, and then what we're going to do is open up a SignalR hub hmm. and communicate across the hub to your browser and do diffs between the browser and the updates that we need to send. Okay, so don't, we'll get don't, into that yeah. more. We don't want to yeah, get too much going on at let's, once. Let's lock in the client side first. So, so client side, yeah. uh, we've got our, our Blazor framework mm -hmm. running on top of Mono. Uh, we're able to load DLLs directly into the browser, okay. which is something very new and mm -hmm. unexpected. That uh, a little bit scary, as yeah. We'll, might we'll say. show us. Uh, we'll we'll pull yeah. up the network traffic here okay. and take a look and see what's. So, what exactly are you shipping from the service side when you do Blazor apps? All of it. We're shipping DLLs down to the browser, and the browser is able to understand 
how to run those DLLs thanks to the Mono runtime. Okay, and hopefully we are doing some uh, some work with linkers and some tree shaking, so we are shipping only what we need on the client uh, side. That is stuff that is in the works. That's okay. coming. Yes. All right. So uh, right now we're shipping down full assemblies, uh, but soon we hope that uh, we hope that um, uh, Steve and his team will come up with a way to to create smaller uh, DLLs and ship those across the wire. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's let's see this. Yeah, so this, this before we get started, okay. we'll talk a little bit about the Blazor framework itself. Um, it has a lot of those things you expect out of a single page application framework or a SPA framework. Mm -hmm. um, it has a virtual DOM. So DOM manipulation is a very taxing effort. So things like jQuery that directly go in and modify and manipulate the document object model in the browser, those things are sometimes pretty inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Blazor has its own shadow DOM, similar to other SPA frameworks like Angular yeah, and React. Yeah. This almost sounds like a very SPA client-side framework with some of the features like routing and layouts and dependence mm -hmm. injection. So we interact with this virtual DOM, and then Blazor does diffing between the actual DOM mm -hmm. and the virtual DOM. So it's only changing what it needs to change rather than repainting that entire uh, that entire DOM within the browser. Gotcha. Okay. So we're we have efficiency there. We have uh, a component model. It's very you know model view view model type mm -hmm. uh, thing. This is something that uh, that developers from other .NET frameworks would appreciate. Sure. Uh, things like uh, UWP and WPF and Silverlight. Um, it's not identical, but it has some similar uh, yeah. type of ceremony. So this this is what we liked about Silverlight development. This is mm -hmm. the, the ease of doing data binding and, and XAML tools, the ecosystem. And if you're saying we can bring some of it back, then yeah, mm -hmm. let's do it. Uh, we have some layout capabilities in there as well. Uh, dependency injection, out of the box. Something that we'd expect from a modern mm -hmm. uh, .NET uh, framework. So we have that as well. Uh, we have routing that's very easy, follows that uh, razor pages type of uh, construct where we, okay. we open up a page and have an at page attribute and we'll show mm -hmm. some of that in a moment. And then again the, the uh, JavaScript interop is part of this sure. as well. Sure. Uh, so we'll show that too. Okay. So let's jump straight into Visual Studio. Right. Now I have some tooling that I have to install. If you want to install this tooling you go to blazor.net and just follow the step-by-step -step instructions there and you'll have the same tooling that I'm showing now. Okay. Uh, so in Visual Studio, I have a file new project experience for this. And I am going to click on the ASP.NET Core web application uh, project template. And uh, we'll just do OK here to spin up a new project. And notice I have three new projects in here. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a Blazor, Blazor, ASP.NET Core hosted, and Blazor server side. So let's dig yeah. into these really quick. So before you do that, this has mm -hmm. to be uh, ASP.NET Core 2.1 release and forward? Yes. Okay. Uh, as of now, so as of recording, that's what it is. And okay. Visual Studio 15.7 or 8. Okay. Um, and those instructions, again, are on Blazor.NET. You'll find those sure. there. They may be updated uh, after this video airs. So okay. uh, make sure you keep an eye there. But you do need to install these. You're not going to come out of the box in your normal .NET installation. Right. Yeah. Uh, so our first project, think of this Blazor app is a client-side only uh, template. So okay. if you were to do this in, say, just normal JavaScript terms, it would be HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Static files you run on your client only. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're not talking about server interaction. You can still have server interactions, but you do that through web APIs and things like that. They're not included in this project. Sure. Uh, the next one over is the Blazor ASP.NET Core hosted. I like to call this the full stack template. Mm -hmm. So this has the previous project template, but it also includes ASP.NET Core and some web API endpoints that we can hit. So that's kind of like your back end then for your mm -hmm. app. Yeah, and ASP.NET is actually hosting the application as I well. See. With the first example, you don't even really need a host. No, you right. just need somewhere to stick yeah. your files, and it's just stuff the browser understands, so it can pick it up and run it. Sure. Just like an HTML, JavaScript, CSS project, you, know, you could put it on GitHub pages and host it there. Any FTP server, it can Any just pull, FTP it, pull down server. and run. Okay. Exactly, Azure storage. You yeah. could host your application from okay. uh, using that format. The second one here, though, 
this actually has ASP.NET Core hosting the application for you. Um, it also has a web API endpoint for you to be able to hit. And it also has a concept of code sharing. Remember, we're using the same language now on the browser client yeah. and the server. So that's interesting. So um, folks doing Node.js, uh, we are used to doing like JavaScript front and back. And mm -hmm. now we can do C Sharp front and back, essentially, right? Absolutely. Okay. So that's where that one sits. This is a brand new project. Okay. Uh, so this is where I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. This is a server side model, no WebAssembly involved, hmm. where the Blazor framework sits on the server as an application, and the server uh, connects through WebSockets down to the browser hmm. using SignalR. Okay. Those packets with SignalR are sent th through a binary transfer. Hmm. So it's actually taking the diff from uh, your updates, your interactions, and sending that up to the server. The server then processes the changes in Blazor, and then Blazor knows the diffs to make, sends that down the wire in a binary packet, and then uh, the signal our client picks it up and replaces what it needs to in the browser. Interesting. So it's a very interesting approach uh, to doing this type of development. Yeah, and if, if you talk about like server side, now you're kind of in Node.js territory, and you can kind of think about what this might mean for Electron JS apps, maybe uh, that run on the desktop. But we'll, we'll get to that. But I mean, mm -hmm. this is interesting that we can actually host Blazor outside of the web browser's process and yeah, just yeah. do it all on the server or desktop. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of extending that UI thread across the wire mm -hmm. instead of uh, doing it right there in the browser on the sure. client. Sure. So let's actually jump into uh, this first Blazor template okay. uh, so we can actually show some code and how yeah. this stuff is structured. So I'm going to spin this up, file new project, uh, look in our solution explorer, see what we get. Um, some of these things may seem very familiar out of the box because they yeah. follow conventions that we already use in ASP.NET development. In particular, this looks familiar if you do any Razor pages. So you don't have the model view controller pipeline, you have pages, right? And Absolutely. that's where you render things from. So we'll start top down. We have our WW root. Okay. So this is uh, just like you would find normally, this is static resources for our application. Okay. Uh, we go into pages, like you said, Razor pages, same idea here. Uh, we have all of the uh, the features of our application. Uh, people like to talk about apps and features now. Like we want to have our, uh, in this case, our component feature and our fetch data feature, and mm -hmm. we can dive into those uh, uh, files here in just a moment. And then our shared libraries, or our shared uh, views. Uh, same, same concept as yeah. ASP.NET. We have uh, things like templates in our main layout, and even uh, we can even have a view imports file. Sure. Uh, to do uh, those global using statements and bring in uh, component libraries and things like that. Okay. Uh, and another familiar concept is the startup and program.cs files that you find in .NET Core projects. Uh, those are the things that bootstrap your application and um, configure dependency injection, all of those great things. Okay. So let's give this guy a run. We'll get this started and kick it off in the browser, and then we'll go look at the code behind it. So you're running see how this, this works. in IS Express, but you just said it may not need yeah, any we, of that. Yeah, we don't really need to do all that. Uh, we, could, we could host this on GitHub pages if we okay. wanted to. These are all static files all right. um, that, that we're using here. Um, so we get our Hello World app. We have a couple of features here. We have our, our counter component. Mm -hmm. uh, we can click and increment a counter. You're not coming back to the server. Uh, so no, there is no server. Okay. We're, we're not doing any data transfer across mm -hmm. any, anything right now. We have a fetch data, but it's all being handled locally. So we're just mm -hmm. grabbing a JSON file sure. and just pumping the data into the, into the application. Okay. So we're, we're grabbing that static JSON file. It's not coming from a web service or anything at this point. Okay. So right now, it kind of looks like an average application. Mm -hmm. But let's see how it's built. So let's dive into some of the features here. Uh, let's open the counter component or the counter page. You'll notice right away this uh, is the Razor syntax. Mm -hmm. It's a .cshtml file, yep. and it uses very familiar conventions. It does, yes. Uh, at the very top, we have our router. So mm. page is at the counter um, uh, endpoint. So if we go to counter in our browser, that's where we end up. And that and routing is built in. That routing is built into the okay. framework. 
So now uh, we have just simple HTML here. We have our, our header tag, uh, and then we have our current count, and then we're using Razor here to mm -hmm. uh, display a value of current count. Sure. Uh, we have a button to click, and then we have a uh, event binding to the on click event. And then we have a function block here that has our functionality for this page. So mm -hmm. there's our current count that's being bound up here. Mm -hmm. And you we have our event right handler for yeah. the increment count. So when you say at functions, like that's C sharp, right? That you're this is, yeah, this is Razor, and okay. everything inside of this block is C sharp code. Yeah, yeah. So there's no JavaScript at all on this page. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we click the button, it invokes this increment count function, and it's data bound to this uh, this current count sure. value. Yep. So that's the view that we see here when we click this button. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're able to do that with very little code. Um, it's all, uh, there's no postbacks going to the server. It's all being handled locally on the client um, in a very easy to understand fashion. Okay. So if you go back to the browser for a second. So mm -hmm. um, you said this is, it, it has a shadow DOM, but there is a DOM out there. So if you right click, you will actually see HTML. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So those uh, C sharp or CS HTML files are being rendered out. Uh, into the browser, so you see your bootstrap rows and mm -hmm. uh, your link, your links and your buttons and all those good things. Um, let's let's actually jump over to our network tab uh, yeah. while we're in here and just uh, do something interesting. Let's do empty cache and reload. And when this comes down across the wire, notice that uh, we're actually sending DLL files from the server. Mm -hmm. A little scary. So but it's here. yeah, let's let's see. These all get loaded in through Web WebAssembly, okay. and our our application spins up, and it's all client side. Okay. So we're actually running these DLLs locally on the client. That's very interesting. You're literally shipping .NET DLLs to the browser, absolutely, letting it figure it out at runtime. And you, like, if you look at the sizes, this is where you're saying it'll get better. Like we'll ship smaller and smaller as we go. Yeah, along. yeah. Okay. Right now, uh, you can see that we're shipping the .NET standard DLL, MS Core Lib, yeah. all these things as a whole across the wire. Um, I would imagine uh, I'm not on the dev team, just for clarification. Yeah. Uh, but I've had discussions with Daniel Roth, the PM on the team, and he's um, he's adamant about uh, making these things smaller and, okay. and more compact when they go across the wire. Sure. So. Let's jump back into code again. Um, we'll take a quick look at the fetch data. Uh, this is the view that if we click fetch data here, we have a little bit of a grid showing mm -hmm. some data that's coming in. Um, the first thing I want to point out again, we have routing. And then underneath routing, we have this at inject um, uh, declaration up here. Right. So this is actually calling out to the de dependency injection system, mm -hmm. and it's asking for the HTTP client that's registered in dependency injection. So that's going to get resolved. Uh, and then down in the code of this page, uh, you'll see we use that HTTP client right. to go to a file on local storage. Okay. Uh, so you're not going anywhere. It's mm -hmm. just a JSON that you're loading. But yep. you could go. Uh, across the network if you wanted to. Absolutely. Okay. We could make requests to uh, back-end services and all those type of things. And we're doing it in a familiar .NET way. Indeed. We're using okay. HTTP client and doing a get JSON async to pull in a object type of an array of weather forecasts. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, JSON binding that's happening aut automatically in here. Uh, so we don't need to even worry about those type of things. Sure. And then there's our weather forecast object right there. Right. So we're we're getting these values and just uh, mapping those values from the JSON into this object, and then we iterate over those uh, in the right. the view. So at this point, is this uh, would you say these are views or would you say these are components? So the these are both actually. Okay. So we have. Uh, the concept of a page here, we're using this at page directive with the routing, uh, but I could actually come into my home or my index, and uh, let's wipe this component out for a moment, and I can come in here and type in counter. Ah. Notice the nice IntelliSense come up, and we'll close that tag, 
And I'll come back to my browser and refresh. And let's go home and ref wait for it to refresh. Uh, we're getting a uh, message. We, I'm actually in debug mode, so mm -hmm. let's, let's actually run this a different way. Let's do, whoop, let's do a control F5. So we'll run without debugging. So we can refresh this experience. Now, remember, this is an experimental uh, project. Okay. Uh, so the debugging experience right now is a little lackluster. Um, there's some work being done to make debugging available in the browser. We can actually, at current state, um, set breakpoints. In C Sharp? In the browser, we can set breakpoints. We'll look at that in a few moments, because I don't want to get too <laughs> off track. Uh, <laughs> so we'll be able, at some point, we'll be able to debug C Sharp code in Chrome or IE. Wow. Okay. Uh, at current state, it's not quite there, but it's getting there. So uh, back to talking about the yeah. components. So you have the counter. Taken that entire page, use it as a yeah. component. I see. Uh, so and that's not something you were able to do at all in ASP.NET, MVC, or Core, or Razor. This that's is correct. New, this, is this is a new is component model. A component. So this is kind of like, in some ways, like Angular and React. You're just Absolutely. literally plopping a component down into a page. Absolutely. Okay. So very similar concept to those things. Um, you could say it was it was inspired by or borrowed from those, which sure. those things ins were inspired by and borrowed from things like WPF. Oh, absolutely. So. We rediscovered the same problems <laughs> over and over again. So let's let's have a little fun with the counter component that we okay. have. Uh, we'll go back to this page here and let's set up a property. So uh, we actually have a shortcut for this now in the tooling and uh, we can say uh, instead of prop tab tab which we might be used to to do this mm -hmm. uh, we can say para parameter tab hmm. tab and now we get the parameter attribute and then we can expose a property on our component so okay. let's call this uh, count by so this is an integer that we'll set to, to be count by. Okay. And instead of just incrementing this internally, we can just say uh, plus equals uh, count by. We might want to set a default value yeah, here. So what if somebody does one. not pass in the parameter? So we'll do that. Okay. I saved it. We'll go back to our index. And now we can say count uh, I may have to recompile here. Let's do a build. And now we can do count by. There we go. Now our IntelliSense comes up. Uh, we needed to build that library out. I can mm -hmm. set that to an integer of five. Yeah. And we'll save this and we'll refresh our page. So if I'm getting this right, so these are individual components. So mm -hmm. the actual counter should still increment by one, but this one should pick up the parameter. Right. So the instance of the counter on my index page counts by uh, five. See. Yep. Uh, and the instance of the counter on the counter page right. is only counting by one. Sure. But now we've extended that component out and actually made it a little more robust yeah. where we can have uh, like a developer experience where you can type in mm -hmm. and get a telesense and set variables and, and properties on, on the object this or the component. Cool. Yeah. So a very simple component model to understand. Right. Right. Uh, this is, is absolutely simple to get up and running. Uh, so let's take a look at the other project type. So that's the first half of a full hour of Sam and Ed talking about Blazor. The next episode of Visual Studio Toolbox will continue on with their conversation.